virtual event the, to this webinar organized by Eden in occasion of the European Distance Learning Week. And uh, I'm uh, happy to, to say that today we count uh, with an interesting theme and uh, uh, an interesting, very inter interesting set of presenters. So the theme is Open Education and the title of the event is Perspectives on Open Education. So we want to give some uh, original perspectives and some, uh, some specific... Uh, Okay, sorry guys. Okay, la chiave lì. Okay, sorry guys, but as you as I was telling you before, I'm we are witnessing a live moment of a school setting. I I'm in a school in this very moment and I was thrown out by a bunch of students from a room. So I hope you can hear me now and uh, very sorry for this, uh, but these things happen. And uh, now while I find a, a can you, okay, now the situation is a bit quieter, okay. So, uh, whilst I find a quieter place uh, to speak from, I would like to give the word, uh, so I would like to speak second, and I would like to give the word to, Di to Diana, if possible, so I can find a, a quiet place to speak from. Hi, everybody, can you hear me? Diana, can you? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Hi, so thank you very much for allowing me to join you very briefly live. I'm unfortunately just boarding now in the airport, so I will I kindly ask Fabio, I mean Warsaw, boarding to go to Kauna because my flight to uh, Frankfurt was cancelled. So I will kindly ask Fabio to share the YouTube registration, the video which I prepared, or any, in any way, so there are two different ways in which you can listen to my presentation for today. Either you watch the YouTube video or Fabio will share the video now on the screen. And if you have questions, I'll be able to, to answer them in the chat because I will need very soon to disconnect my, my video and my microphone. Is that okay with you, Fabio? Okay, Diana. So let me. S okay, so I suggest we go with the video. So we have a recorded version of you while you board. Thank you. With the video. Thank you. Learning Center of the Polytechnica University of Timisoara, Romania, and my presentation part of the European Distance Learning Week, which is organized by Eden, an organization in which I'm members of for almost 20 years, is about augmented reality in open education. We are all aware of the digital literacies and what we need to teach and to encourage our students to gain as competencies and skills, especially in the higher education system, which we call digital competencies or digital literacies, skills and competencies. One of the things which interests me for many years is the computational thinking, which nowadays becomes quite a custom for all the students, not necessarily students which are in engineering or in science or STEM subjects, to develop as a new methodology of computational thinking, which in fact use abstraction and decomposition for learning new things, for understanding and learning new things. Since 2011, I became quite aware of the new methods for the creative creators. We need to develop the 21st century skills for our students, which will need to become creative creators, which 
Tom Friedman described as the well-educated, imaginative, collaborative, confident people who will take personal responsibility and will go Yeah, it is it stopped for me also. Very strange. Adding extra beside the 21st century skills. There are students which will need to learn independently and digitally their entire life. Okay, Do we prepare them in our higher education? It's coming back. Sorry for this, everybody. Do we make Did them we aware again? of the skills and abilities which they need to have? Do we prepare for their digital life after the end of the university degree? One of the methods to do this is to use augmented reality. And there are several examples of the use of the augmented reality nowadays in education, like in math school or in chemistry or in science subjects where you can learn and understand better concepts and theories by seeing and playing with simulations and so on. Or, for example, in schools, in engineering subjects, where you can understand how fluids work in and work in an engine and so on. But this, this will require a lot of development from the multimedia teams. And this usually involves just a tiny bit of the development part of the students. But, for example, new skills like these applications allow them to do, like to, to learn and to create content, like the museum's application, will allow them to do something more. What, why is important to use augmented reality nowadays in education? Mainly because it's here and because students already start using it by playing different games which use augmented reality and they use their mobile phones quite a lot. The added value is the collaborative learning experience which they can gain and also the encouragement and the motivation to learn something new more interactively and more digitally. A study done some years ago shows that the use of augmented reality in higher education is mainly related to science and medical schools and humanities and art, like the examples which I just showed. But they can be used in different subjects and in different areas. One of the examples which I'm going to show is based on my personal experience, which is mainly using augmented reality tools in a, the TalkTech project, which is a virtual mobility project, which is done between the students from Romania and United States for every year since 28, 28, so almost 10 years now, where students from a university from Boston with the students from my university in Timișoara work collaboratively in teams of two, two Romanians and two Americans, to develop the multimedia artifact. In the 2016 project, we asked them to develop an in an augmented reality application, an artifact using augmented reality. How
a question for the group. Can everybody hear well uh, the video by Diana? Because some people are having problem in uh, with some breaking up of the video. So it seems there are some issues with it stops regularly, yes. Yeah. Okay, so I suggest we stop this video for now. In any case, it can be then put on the Eden, on the Eden YouTube channel and we move to uh, Estela. Uh, if you follow the, the order, we move to Estela Daos Kleine from Blauta, uh, Blautat Magnus University from Lithuania. Sorry for the way I mispronounced for sure your, your name and surname and even institution. And thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Fabio. I hope you can hear me well. And today I will talk about how virtual mobility opens education, how we, uh, from at least our perspective, open education with the cases of virtual mobility. And I'm Stella Dukšene. I come from Vitoras Magnus University and Lithuanian Association of Distance and e Learning from Lithuania. Uh, and uh, why should uh, or how we can open education through virtual mobility? Briefly, I will focus on why we talk about virtual mobility and how we understand what is virtual mobility and how these cases or these activities really opens up our educational practices. So first of all, uh, when talking about education, there are really different uh, perspectives and really different uh, uh, explanations and understandings or definitions how we define what is virtual mobility. However, most of them agree upon and that in high education institutions, uh, when we talk about virtual mobility, we usually aim with these activities in cooperation of higher education institutions. Of course, the cooperation usually is either blended or virtual, and so for that we apply technological solutions. However, as in education, we aim at uh, teaching and learning. In virtual mobility, we also aim at teaching and learning and communication, collaboration or research of the participants. And of course, we try to achieve the academic goals uh, and uh, to recognize the achievements. And uh, of course, virtual mobility let us to focus on the development of intercultural competence, or sometimes we call them as virtual mobility competences. And uh, furthermore, to elaborate uh, usually how we understand what are these activities that we implement by virtual mobility, sometimes some, some, someone calls them as virtual exchange. Uh, usually in the best known practices that we and other uh, European universities have implemented uh, uh, when we talk about virtual mobility is usually a course uh, delivered in another institution abroad. It may be a part of the course, it may be a seminar or some other, other type of activity a series of seminars or even the whole program uh, delivered by another institution that the students and teachers can participate virtually in online studies. But we also there focus on not just the distance learning but intercultural competence development as well. Also, another type of activity may be uh, the courses that are either jointly developed and or delivered jointly with another institution. For example, a course uh, that is developed together between the teachers uh, from several universities. They, for example, develop a course together and then deliver the course uh, online or in a blended mode when the students have the possibilities to collaborate on different activities and uh, uh, in this way to inter internationalize and uh, share their cultural approaches at certain topics, for example. Also, there may be a virtual placement or at the company abroad that is also 
an activity that may be developed and also there are a lot of activities that are um, combined with physical mobility or to foster physical mobility so either the courses before the physical exchange or either the courses to extend your virtual course or extend your physical mobility course or to get acquainted to learn language or to learn some cultural things before coming that are also combined with the physical activities. And how these activities open our education? Of course, when we look at it from institutional perspective, as institutions, when they start, um, for, when they look for the collaboration and when they start sharing or at least think about collaborating in different online course delivery, they usually have to open their practice, not only for the internal revision, but also they have to share what they do uh, for other partners and uh, to share their courses, to share their delivery schemes and how uh, the learning is organized in the institution. So in this way, they really open their practices for the revision. Uh, when we start implementing virtual mobility, so these activities really open all departments for collaboration, for virtual collaboration. If a student wants to do a virtual course in another institution, there, there are different departments in both institutions that need to collaborate, to agree upon how everything will be organized and how, where the student can come to and where he or she can uh, come with the issues and etc. There are So in this way, all departments are involved in this virtual collaboration. And of course, when we come to the learning process, it requires a lot of uh, openness uh, from the teachers to share their practice and to open and for the students to participate. And here I will focus in my presentation mostly on the two perspectives, on the teacher perspective and on the student perspective as uh, in, there are a lot of, of course, institutional issues that we, I could talk about, but maybe it would be more interesting for you to hear more from the teacher perspective and student perspective. So how teachers should uh, be open and how this process of virtual mobility open it challenges teachers with the openness. First of all, you as the teacher have to be open for the changes in your course. And of course, for, you have to, uh, first of all, open uh, your practice for revision. Uh, it's not only the internal revision that you usually have from your institutional colleagues, but also if you want to collaborate on a joint course delivery with a teacher from another abroad institution, you have to open your practices uh, and what you do uh, for this teacher and for that university as well. And if you want to attract learners, virtual learners into your course. You have to open and present your course also publicly and you have to prepare a lot of uh, marketing material so it really attracts your course uh, students from another institutions to your course. So it's, there are a lot of challenges for you as a teacher that are related to the openness. And when we talk about how you as a teacher have to change the practice you usually have it is uh, if you are come from traditional university meaning having your students in the auditorium and here comes uh, students or uh, at least uh, come um, not the students but if you have students virtual students and uh, physical students in your class you have to combine and you have to change your practice here by combining uh, these either group work of students or, or either delivery approaches that you have to do the presentations in online and as well as in the group in the face-to-face -face mode. So you have to be flexible here and you have to adapt. Also, you as a teacher sometimes meet this kind of challenges where students coming from virtually coming to your university from another institution uh, come later than your semester started or they want to start learning earlier than the semester starts in your institution. So you also have to have this in mind and 
have to manage this uh, joining of students earlier or later. Uh, also, um, this, this is a challenge for you as a teacher, um, and you have to op be open and flexible for this. And of course, um, these are the challenges that teachers usually face in while uh, working or delivering uh, courses in virtual mobility mode. When thinking and talking about the perspective of students, uh, we have several cases where bachelor type of students or master type of students uh, had, uh, had these virtual mobility courses in another institution. And how this, uh, first of all, uh, requires them to be open uh, first of all, I share here with you some testimonies from our cases of the bachelor students. First of all, it requires them uh, to be open and to be really interested either in the topic of the course that is being delivered or either in the, the different mode of delivery and to come and to participate. Because, for example, in Lithuania, we don't have a challenge uh, of the students with the English language. They, all of them know uh, English language. However, in these courses, they usually are afraid to participate because of the English language, because they fear sometimes that uh, they won't know how to express themselves properly or how if they really will understand what the teacher is, is saying there. So it really requires openness from them to come and participate. And of course, as these courses are focusing usually on the uh, also sharing intercultural approaches, uh, it is uh, they open their minds for other cultures. They learn how the subjects are delivered in another institution. They learn how everything, studies are organized in another institution, what virtual learning platforms, other institutions, uh, use or uh, how many contact hours do you really organize. So it is really, they, sh they gain a lot and this opens their approach to learning as well, as well as not only learning, but also uh, personal perspectives. And uh, to share some, uh, uh, some testimonies from our master pro program students, uh, that they are participating in the jointly delivered course uh, uh, on the global social problems. The main idea that we get from them is that uh, when the course is delivered, uh, not only from Lithuanian perspective, but at least Lithuanian and in our case, American perspective as the teachers come from Lithuanian America, they really, uh, the course really opens their minds in the way uh, in, in the way how the course is organized, but also in the way how, what kind of problems are discussed in the course. As the course looks at the global social problems, there's the possibility that the course is delivered not only by Lithuanian teachers, provides them with the possibility that they analyze the problems that are really global and not uh, only in Lithuania. And uh, mainly to sum up this, both these both uh, experiences and perspectives from students and from teachers, what it usually uh, gives them is, of course, the difference knowing uh, not only in the intercultural competences that we usually aim at in virtual mobility, but also, also language competence development. They can they have the possibilities to improve their language competences. And of course, ICT competences and as uh, activities usually are virtual. So the collaboration online competences and the use of different tools for communication, for accessing uh, your learning content, for collaboration online. And of course, as we aim at virtual at university, usually at achievement of learning of outcomes. Uh, so these courses also improve their learning outcomes, and so this way educational perspective, but also personal and social competences are improved in these in this courses. And what the students usually mention here is that um, 
the courses mostly the more interesting if you have uh, more different cultures or different students coming from different institutions as the course in our university is also suggested for the students uh, who are on Erasmus studies in the university to be joined. So uh, if more students and different cultures come to the course, then the course is really more interested to be shared from different cultural perspectives. That all this uh, brings openness and uh, opens the, uh, not only educational perspective, but also cultural perspective to our students. So this is shortly what are my uh, visions for how uh, the courses from teacher and student perspective open virtual mobility courses open education. And I'm really glad if you have any questions so I can elaborate or maybe we can discuss them later if you have. Thank you. Later, I will also sketch a relation between open education and, and virtual mobility. So very interesting to see what you're thinking about. I already I already told the participants uh, to to write their questions in the chat. So please, if you have any urgent question, just put it in the chat. Otherwise, we will use some time at the end of the of the session for some questions to all the panelists. So uh, I would like now to give the floor to Susan Huggins. Actually. It's a, it's a privilege to have uh, somebody from the Open Education Consortium with us, especially because this year, we shouldn't forget, is the year of open. So we are in a special year for open education, a year of many anniversaries, a year of the lately celebrated UNESCO uh, Second World OER Congress. So it's again a special year and uh, we are all looking forward to hear what happened and what is still going to happen and how you feel about this uh, uh, long, well, year-long celebration about openness in education. The floor is yours. I know Eden has contributed uh, quite a lot to this and we have uh, our responsible person for, for open education. Thank you so much. I appreciate it and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share a little bit about the year of open, uh, what we did, where we're going, and what 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 uh what what's coming for 2018 uh can everyone hear it come the presentation all righty let me get started here so real quickly the things that i'm going to cover this morning as i mentioned is a little bit about the year of open how it got started and what the intent was and then i want to share with you some of the vision we have for 2018 First, the year of open, um, we started talking about the year of open back in 2016. We realized that during 2017, many great anniversaries were coming together that needed to be recognized. Um, some of the significant milestones for open education that happened during 2017, for example, the term open educational resources was created 15 years ago. The Budapest Open Access Initiative was 15 years ago. Um, there were also some significant 10-year anniversaries. The Cape Town Declaration, Creative Commons was uh, the first license was released. Uh, five years ago, the first Open Education Week launched, as well as the Paris OER Declaration. So as you can see, many, many, many milestone events came together during 2017. So as we were thinking about what we could do to highlight these events and bring attention to them and also to show their importance in open education and how it got us to where we are today, we coined the Year of Open. We wanted to spend a whole year and highlight these many subjects that I was just sharing with you. <clears throat> So the Year of Open was coined. Uh, we aligned a different topic with each month, uh, which by the way, um, our archives, so you can go back and, and review each of our archived months. But during the Year of Open, we had contributors literally from all over the world. And they contributed to a particular topic 
uh, in which they were the subject matter expert. Many just simply wrote articles, they contributed videos. Um, it was also a very social time of year. So we only have two months left. We're very excited. Uh, this month, during November, we're discussing the open web. Um, we already have two contributors. We have four or five still lined up to go. And what happens is on our website, yearofopendart.org, we feature a, a monthly topic. And we also have subject matter experts that contribute to that topic. So in November, we're talking about the open web and uh, wrapping up the year of 2017, we'll be talking about open licensing. So taking, uh, there's our uh, social, you can uh, join us, you can follow us at Year of Open. Uh, Twitter is extremely active, uh, as well as our Facebook. You can post a story, contribute to a topic on Facebook. So just to share with you a few things that happened during 2017 that to us were really extraordinary. We did not anticipate quite the activity and response that we did get. So we spent, as I mentioned, each month was dedicated to a different topic. And as you can see, the topics were everything from open education to open culture, open software, open policy. Um, some of the topics were uh, quite engaging. I think open pedagogy was our most active month, very lively topics, and we had a, a few webinars that month, brought very um, a global perspective to that. It's a very interesting, you can go back and look at the videos. Our statistics to date, oh, I forgot to change September to October, but we have had over 6,000 people from 145 countries access our website, access our resources that we have built so far this year. And we, this is what I think is really interesting, is we expected to have at least 12 contributors, one for each month during the year of open. We've had over 81, and by the time we close at the end of December, we will have uh, almost 100 contributors, subject matter experts in various um, subjects. We've also hosted six live events during the year. And just as an FYI, I thought I would list our five most engaging topics from this past year. Open pedagogy, open education, open science was very interesting, OER, and then of course, open degrees, which we focused on just a few months ago. This just gives you uh, an idea, a visual idea <clears throat> of all the various countries that open education touched during 2017. Um, now, what I'd like to share with you a little bit about is what we have in store for 2018. We are real excited to continue our year of open events, but 2018, we are going to focus on action. During 2017, we discussed a lot of information, shared a lot of information, discussed a lot of different topics. But in 2018, we want to see how these topics were put into action, what we've done with the topics, what various groups are doing with the topics, how it has disrupted education, and how it has transformed education. We are really excited uh, about some of the topics that we'll be kicking off with um, earlier in the year. Uh, wanted to provide my information. Uh, please email me if you have any questions, contact me. Also, if you're interested in contributing to a particular subject or would like to host a particular subject next year, please reach out to me, let me know uh, your interest. Um, some of the subjects that we will focus on, uh, as I was saying, are activities that either have transpired, have statistics, and what we want to do is offer an opportunity for others to see what you've done so that the processes can be replicated and shared throughout the globe. So that's it for me. I am very happy to take some questions at the end of our webinar, but thank you for joining. I appreciate it. I love sharing about the Year of Open. Uh, look us up on Twitter, follow us, follow us on Facebook, and um, join us next year. Thank you.
I don't know if we can make a, a let's say, quick improvisation by asking her to, to give us a quick view of, of this uh, of this important year from the point of view of Eden. I know this was not foreseen, but let's see if she can if she can join. In any case, I'm asking uh, still uh, people to to put their, your question into the into the chat. And uh, let me see. Okay, Lisa can do that. So if uh, uh, I would like, uh, <clears throat> whilst uh, I'll thank again Susan to ask Lisa if you can uh, quickly uh, give us a let's say a mini feedback on the on what Eden did during this uh, this year of open so that we can have even a broader yeah let me share of um, the some of the live events that we held during the year were with Eden uh, we did joint webinars throughout the month they they were recorded and they were um, archived on our website um, we have actually have held one every month since the month of September and we do have one coming up later on this month on the open web and we will have subject, several subject matter experts that will speak to this, but it is an open Twitter event. It is extremely engaging, very insightful. And what I have found I is uh, some great are... networking events, finding out about events that, you know, she we not speak. would have otherwise heard about. Um, so that's what we've been doing with Eden. It's been a great partnership, and we look forward to working uh, with Eden in 2018. Yeah, absolutely. I think this uh, yeah, this cooperation is uh, it's very fruitful for well for both of can us of our networks and especially for the practitioners out there. Okay, Liz, I, I can see your chance. smile. Can I also hear your voice? Great. Let me see. <laughs> okay, your smile is there. Yes, just to give you an update or just an overview of some of the things we've yes. done in Eden this year. Um, well, in February we were involved in the UNESCO initiative in Malta. Um, where there was some regional European com consultation on different open education resources. And then in March, we were involved in Open Education Week. Um, and for example, Cable Green spoke about open education, some of the moral business and policy cases for OER. And we had a, a panel session on how to be more open. And of course, we had the Eden Chats. Now, lots of this is already on the Eden website uh, with recording. So please be sure to, to go there and check it out. Um, also in June at the Eden Annual Conference, we had some keynotes and some workshops and a lot of different sessions around OER and open education. And in September was the Slovenia OER Forum. Um, so we've been very active. And of course, this week we've got European Distance Learning Week together with National Distance Learning Week put on by USDLA. Uh, so if you haven't looked at their site, please be sure to do that. And then, of course, this week is also the Open Professional Collaboration for Open Classroom Conference in CONUS. So we really have a lot of things happening right now um, in Eden in terms of, you know, just the topic of open and the year of open. And so if you haven't had an opportunity, please check out the Eden website, look at some of the uh, recordings that we have there on these different activities, and take part for the rest of this week and also with the Eden um, chats that are coming up uh, this month and next month. Um, and I put the link in the um, chat box so that you can see it. Uh, and, and we hope to see you there. Oh my goodness, there's a whole bunch of slides. Yeah, yeah I, I can. You guys Thank you for this uh, last minute uh, <laughs> joining. Thank you very much. So okay, it's really great. You. I was moving them. I was trying to move them for you. So I was more or less following you. Don't worry. So, uh, well, I was saying that it's, it's good to see when, uh, when really, let's say, global and European networks like ours are working together for the same, for the same objective. I think it's, uh, it's really a, a powerful dynamic. Um, so I think whilst we wait for Andrew Law, which should be our last speaker, uh, I have a, my presentation, which I wasn't able to give before, since I was uh, assaulted by a group of, uh, of students actually eager to learn about technology. It was in a technology lab, 
when I was assaulted by them. Let me look for it. In fact, uh, my presentation should have probably gone first, but now it makes even more sense. More sense. Let me see. Yes. Because in fact, we have spoken about uh, about uh, technology with augmented reality, we've spoken about virtual mobility, and we've spoken about open education. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the the idea of this uh, of this uh, webinar with different perspectives, let's say, on open education, started with, um, by 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 talking uh, about the relation between open education and international cooperation, internationalization, which is actually the daily life and the daily work of institutions like Eden, of institutions like the OEC, and so on. And in fact, uh, we believe, now sorry for the slides, sometimes the, the fonts have a bit, uh, are moving a bit, but in fact, we think that open education and higher education, especially cooperation, are very connected, but sometimes in terms of research, they risk to be treated as two separated worlds. Uh, what do I mean by this? Uh, I mean that the classic international education uh, model or, or context uh, with students' mobility in the first place, uh, with teaching in different languages, uh, which is relevant only to some institutions and to some disciplines, or mainly to some institutions and disciplines, where internationalization is not so central to, to, the, to the, the learning process of the students and so on let's say, is moving towards a new uh, environment where we see uh, a, a, number of, or a number of issues, including massification of higher education, especially in a number of developing countries. We see a lot of students' mobility across the nations and within nations, within countries. We see, of course, an increased use of ICT, as Diana and, and Stella were pointing at before. And especially we see the, the need to educate students for global competences. And I like very much when, Stella, you pointed to virtual mobility as a tool for a better, I would say, globalization or for a better international cooperation. I think this is really the way we should go for. Uh, and so we have a new environment, sort of, uh, and let's say what we think is that uh, we should put forward a different or a new uh, kind of uh, cooperation between and among institutions. Here I'm talking about higher education institutions, but the same is, can be true for schools or for other, for other kinds of institutions. And uh, I would like to, to propose to you the concept of transformational partnerships, which, is, uh, which was uh, coined by Susan Sutton, an American lady like the two ones who preceded me before. And, and basically, we, we believe that open education can facilitate the creation of these transformational partnerships, which are defined as collaborations able to develop common goals and projects over time in which resources are combined and partnerships are expansive, ever-growing and relationships oriented. So the idea is to move from a collaboration which is based on projects, which is uh, happening only when funding is there, and which is uh, scattered by nature to a more uh, intense and a more strategically oriented collaboration, which should bring, let's say, a higher transformation, positive transformation to, to the institutions. And if we look, this is some work we did within a project called Imundus, where we had partners from all over the world exactly looking at the relation between internationalization of higher education and OER slash MOOCs slash virtual mobility. In this project, we, we, we looked at the typical activities of a transformational partnership, what, was, what I was, was mentioning before, and we sketched some potential impact of open educational practices and resources there. And as you can see from this table, in fact, uh, for example, resources sharing can be improved by using OER, of course, can be made easier, can be made cheaper, can be made smoother, and so on. Uh, not only in terms of licenses, but also in terms of, uh, of technical standards and in terms of searchability and discoverability. When we talk about collaborative curriculum development, and uh, I really liked uh, the, the, the mention that Susan made uh, to, to uh, open accreditation, and uh, we have all of us uh, in front of us the, the example of the OER University, which is going towards these, uh, uh, this kind of open accreditation schemes. And in fact, OEP can facilitate uh, uh, this uh, network curriculum development. Same is true for, for students' mobility and for staff mobility. In fact, uh, virtual mobility, as Estella was saying, uh, we believe it can contribute to 
make exchanges more structural, especially if uh, you, you put some, some virtual collaboration before, between and after the mobilities uh, of students and staff to make this more, let's say, more a process and less uh, a single event in a student or in a professor's life. Same is true for joint promotion, especially in this case through MOOCs uh, and through MOOCs platform because of the um, inner capacity to reach a lot of um, a lot of uh, students and, and, and learners. And in terms of joint research, uh, thanks to Open Science, and I, I again appreciate a lot the fact that Open Science was one of the key themes of the Year of Open because we believe Open Science is, uh, well, it's obviously an integral part of open education, even if, uh, let's say, in some cases the approaches are are different and the levels of development are different. This is basically to say that uh, virtually every activity of a deep partnership, of a deep transformational partnership, can be positively influenced by open educational practices, by open education, whether it's resources, practices, design, open policies, even within institutions. And, uh, and there you see the Imundus logo. I need to thank a lot of partners for this, including Professor Rory McGreal, who came up with us about this uh, uh, conceptualization, and others, including Wayne McIntosh from the OER Foundation. And basically, the, the, we identified six uh, patterns, let's say, of uh, open education enhanced international collaboration. And uh, you can see from the, from the bottom, you have OER contextualization and adaptation, which is happening all the time, and it is a sort of collaboration, it should be a sort of a collaboration. You have a number of practices of knowledge sharing in open education, which is what we are doing today, basically. But, uh, of course, uh, when this is done in uh, between a couple of institutions or between more than, than two institutions, this is, uh, is contributing to, uh, to an important transformational link, to transformation of the institutions. We have joint promotion through MOOCs platforms, which is something that universities are doing together many times. We have, uh, and this connects a lot with the first presentation we heard, uh, open educational resources based virtual mobility schemes. And I would like to hear later what Estella thinks about this, uh, this pattern that we found a lot emerging from, uh, from our research. We have collaborative open courses development, which is not only jointly promoting what, you, what, what you're learning, but jointly producing actually your content and your courses. And finally, and here I think of examples like the OERU, for example, we have the, the collaborative accreditation of non-formal learning, possibly using OER. This is actually the cherry of the cake, on the cake. That is why it is on top, because we believe that if uh, we would be able to accredit, accredit collaboratively, so by sharing the responsibility and by sharing the, the, the work, um, learning, which is also non-formal, and especially by, by, which was taken by using OER, we would be really, that would really be a high, an action with high transformational impact. And in fact, as you can see in this picture, the higher you go in the scheme, the, the higher the transformational impact is, and at the same time, the higher the institutional engagement is because uh, for the institutions, for uh, all stakeholders involved from the institution. And then, and this is uh, the end of my, of my quick, uh, let's say, post-introduction. It wanted to be an introduction, but it's coming a bit late. In fact, what we also found out is that uh, uh, soft skills and soft collaboration skills uh, are fundamental when it comes to open education, because open education deals uh, with, uh, let's say, openly sharing, deals with giving away what you are doing and uh, being happy about it, deals with using what others uh, have been doing by, by, by recognizing their work and respecting their work. And so it's not only a matter of trust, which is a key word which comes out all the time when we discuss these things. It is a matter of sharing ideas from the very beginning. You can see the two blue men there uh, mounting a bulb by themselves. This is like uh, is an easy, easy simplification of the fact that ideas should be shared openly from the very beginning. And it is, uh, at the end of the day, a matter of collaboration where like the ends on the, on the bottom of the slide uh, are doing something all together that nobody of them could do uh, on their own. So that's just a claim of the importance of, of uh, let's say, soft collaboration skills and soft collaboration, I would say, dynamics uh, when it comes to opening up international collaboration through 
uh, open education practices. That was it. I think uh, I didn't want to go in detail, but just to pinpoint a few, a few possible, uh, let's say, a few of the possible relations between open education, the way we we are considering it now, and uh, internationalization and international cooperation. Uh, do we? I, again, I'm asking people if you have some questions to put them there. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, while we wait, I'm asking the Secretariat if uh, Andrew Lowe from the Open University UK has joined the meeting. Wasn't there before. Let me see if he's there. In the meantime, uh, Estela, if you don't mind, I would like to ask you what's your opinion about the relation between or the use of open educational resources within virtual mobility schemes. Do you think the, that can, really can represent... Thinking about it while you were talking. Uh, from our perspective and the schemes that at least Lithuanian, at least our university in the project teams that we had like six or seven projects on virtual mobility and we have what was the approach on, based on this experience, I can say that we looked more at the virtual mobility from institutional perspective. And our virtual mobility schemes, uh, they, um, they focused more on formal education. Uh, and here I see, I mean, from our perspective, then the open educational resources are co come only as the resource. You may use it or you may not use it while you are implementing formal education courses, or at least courses in higher education, which are recognized by other universities. So from this perspective, then the edu open educational resources are only the resources that you use during these courses. Uh, of course, uh, there may be, if you look at virtual mobility that comes uh, not uh, from institutional perspective, if you look at it from the student or learner perspective where you can learn an open course online, then of course these courses may also be either with open educational resources or without them, or the course may be as open educational resource here. So there I, see, there I see two different approaches. If you look more at the higher education as the formal institution who implements virtual mobility scheme, then open educational resources are only the resource. If you look uh, more as uh, different open courses that are full of open educational resources, and if there is virtual collaboration there, uh, then is, it, it may be different approach. So there are different perspectives uh, and different understandings as I see and as I understand from uh, uh, different uh, representatives uh, who, or different projects when you define what is virtual mobility. And if you don't look at it very much from institutional perspective, then of course there may be open educational based these virtual mobility schemes. However, in higher education, when everything comes to recognition, then uh, these courses are either jointly delivered or either uh, just delivered in, uh, for the abroad students or receiving the abroad students, then these open educational resources are just a regular resource, either to be used or not to be used. I'm not sure if I open answered your question. Innovation uh, possibility. So th thank you very much. That's, uh, that's uh, in line with my thinking. Uh, so, if you don't mind, uh, I'm asking the, uh, the participants, we have uh, 28 participants up until now, and I would like them to, to put uh, your question, please put your questions in the chat. I cannot see them also because the chat is very small, so I'm also asking the, the Secretariat colleagues if you can uh, spot, if you have spot some questions, just, ah, thank you, better now. So, now I should be able to see maybe the, um, the questions. But in between, I hope, Lisa, you are still with us, even if I see your, your, um, your image stopped. I have a question for uh, myself, for both Susan and Lisa. And it has to do with uh, um, well, the international side of, uh, of open education, in the sense that I know, Lisa, you have been studying institutional strategies for openness. And uh, Susan, uh, I guess you are aware of a lot of, uh, let's say, 
um, collaboration strategies for open education. So the members probably of the OEC doing things together. So my question is, uh, um, do you see that? Do you, do you think that some something more could be done to put uh, open education as one of the issues of international? Uh, cooperation among universities and among, and among educational institutions, or is this something that should be first digested at the individual institutional level and then brought into the into the international cooperation arena? Collaboration at an earlier stage than uh, than the institutional uh, appropriation of the idea, because you say that by that you can. Uh, learn from others mistake and from others previous work that's very interesting lisa i know you've been i know you, lisa you've been studying uh, both the european and american uh, universities so what's your view about that uh i'll jump in with that one uh I, I kind of I go back and forth because I you know being inside of a higher education for many years, uh, we tend to talk within ourselves, talk within our group, talk within our own university, and then we share. But often when you do when you do take that path, you find that others may have already ob overcome obstacles and may have resources that you spent time and money to develop. So. I would like to see the collaboration happening sooner than later. I, I think it, you know, uh, facilitates a better use of resources and time, et cetera, et cetera. And I have just, um, one of the things the Year of Open to me has created is networking. Um, people have come together that would have otherwise not even known the other existed. Um, so I, I think collaboration and sharing uh, realizing what each other's doing is still kind of lagging behind. I think we still need more activities like Year of Open, like uh, Open Education Week and Distance Learning Week, more of these kind of events to bring us all together. So I would like to see collaboration earlier. I think a lot of it is context. I think a lot of institutions are just now exploring um, the ideas about how they can become more open. And so they're looking at it from the perspective of, you know, where where are the posit where's the positive impact of going open and, and how can I, you know, get more of a competitive advantage? How can I, you know, uh, meet my student needs uh, in a better way? So I think a lot of it depends on the social and political um, situations of the different countries, at least from my perspective. Um, when I looked at Canada and I looked at the US, um, there were a lot of similarities, but at the same time, there were differences in terms of their strategies for OER. Um, in, the, in Europe, um, it was more, I, I actually looked at the Open University UK, how they were using um, MOOCs to channel students um, you know, using open education courses to channel them into becoming paying students. So I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of it is about perspective. I mean, in the U.S. they were looking at, you know, how can we reduce costs for our students? So they, so they started to use OER in order to, you know, to get, um, to reduce the cost for students. But at the same time, they found that by doing so, they could create really learner-centered um, learner centered content and so they were starting to really redesign their courses to become more learner centered which was a real bonus for the students um, and also for the faculty and there were lots of opportunities um, for them to learn from not just the students but from each other so I would really agree with what Susan was talking about 
um, you know, there needs to be more of these opportunities, communities of practice to come together yeah, to yeah, collaborate and to uh, share resources. Also and, makes and really a lot of sense to me. On, on so I, I just uh, read an email by, from, from, um, from our last speaker who is coming. Germany, I think I mean, he, we had a small with problem with understanding of the timing. Um, but in the meantime, we have a, prob a question by Irina, the Eden's president, who is asking a very difficult question. In fact, basically related related to the school to sector. So who should be authoring OER for schools? Um, she says some say private publishers in order to secure the quality of these resources, while others promote more community development ideas and teacher training on OER development and adaptation. So it's the is the usual question, which is valid for school, still a bit also valid for higher education. So I'm also curious to know what are our panelist, what is our panelist opinion on this? Who should be offering OER, mainly offering OER for schools? Uh, Estela, you have an opinion on this? In, in countries like Italy, I mean, I spend half of my morning, I was telling Irina before, talking to teachers in a school, I'm in, a, in, a, in, a, in a high school at the moment discussing exactly about this. And the issue there is, what do we mean by professional, by, by professional community? You know, what is a professional community? A teacher is a professional in teaching, but maybe he's not a professional in producing content. So it's, a, it's not so, so straightforward, you know, at least in a number of countries, you might need some... Uh, Fine tuning of the concept, so if maybe. Look at OER, who, uh, who is the resource for everyone to be developed. I always say that it shouldn't be given to the private publishers because it usually is clo closed when the publishers or at least companies come in here, usually because they look more or focus more on the, on, on the business model here. And I really would uh, say that these. The OER for, that are being developed for schools, they should have open licenses and they should be, the author of them should be the teachers themselves because usually even if we look who creates resources for the teachers, it's teachers themselves. So I think these teachers should be the authors and the, no publishers should be involved here. At least this is my opinion. Whatever. Uh, I, I've seen it work very successful both ways, uh, but mostly with faculty and schools developing their own. But what I also have found has been very interesting and in is when students have an opportunity to contribute. Often the students are, uh, well, they are the consumers, but often they are also are in the industry or working in the industry. And to have them contributing as well makes it more meaningful to that particular to that particular group. Uh, we also have some publishers in the U.S. that are starting to jump on the open resource uh, wagon, so to speak, and are trying to be more accommodating and open, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think the publishers are just now getting it. They don't like. They still don't quite. Um, get it, and they still have the mindset of uh, the money and uh, the closed licenses, et cetera. So it's mostly been in the U.S. developed inside inside the schools. I, I, I see Frank's comment about uh, OER de being developed by professional communities. Um, I, I do agree with that. I, I, if I could expand on that, professional subject matter expert communities. Um, the, for instance, faculty. You know, faculty are typically the subject matter experts for you know within their particular content. Uh, when faculty are involved. Um, you know, you've got more of a quality product, and uh, especially if they're currently teaching, we'll see product that is kept up and is uh, more quality. Oh, I know it is you, so I will put on your presentation now, and um, so we can have a 
we can have some uh, 15 minutes presentation by you and then some final words by all the speakers and maybe a quick question. Let me get your presentation. This should be it. In the meantime, as usual, of course, uh, participants can go on discussing in the chat. Andrew, can you start your mic and video? Uh, we can. Yes, welcome. We cannot. We cannot see you though, but uh, we can hear you. That's perfect. Go ahead for the ten minutes, and uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we are, we all look forward to to hear your answer to the question on the title of your of your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. In fact, we have still twenty-five people listening, and it's uh, I think. Uh, we have just had a few a few dropouts, but uh, really uh, not many. Yes. So thank you very much. I think this is a perfect pre-conclusion, uh, pre-conclusive yeah. presentation. In fact, you are putting a number of, uh, let's say, delicate points and interesting. So the video should just be arriving. Yes. Okay. So firstly, if I had a clock behind me, it would say five past one. I'm so sorry. I have the time zone wrong. Um, do I still have 10 minutes to rocket through this presentation? Is that okay? I'm because really fact, so as, sorry as you, as, so you, as you point out, uh, I mean, most of these things are debatable and you can find evidence, pro and cons, uh, the, so every more so or less, so every so statement. So I would like to, to ask... Uh, yeah. Um, when I was asked to do this presentation, I was having a fairly bad day and um, part of me was thinking it's failed and I'm pretty miserable and fairly despondent about where we're going. And for some of you, there won't be new news in here, but I'm hoping for some, there'll be some insights that perhaps those that haven't been following the recent announcements from um, the consortium and so on, uh, there might be some new news. So let's move on. Uh, so just to check uh, that we're all using a shared understanding of open education, I'm sure for many of you, it will mean lots of things, but I'm using the rather uh, formal and precise definition of open education to mean uh, that it sits with the five R's, and the five R's are that you can retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute the content. And although these can be seen as quite uh, almost religious goals, they are not, in a sense, the goals, at least as far as I'm concerned, and many people are concerned, um, as an end point in themselves, the real goal is to make sure that people have access to education that might not have otherwise had it. And I think the reason I was beginning to be rather concerned about that goal is whether actually open education has managed to achieve that goal or whether it was going to achieve the goal in the longer term. In some senses, OER should be fine. It's a grassroots methodology, and it's a grassroots crowd, and it's a grassroots crowd that wants to do a good. It's powered by technologies and, uh, and uh, interconnected internet services, which means that that crowd is well armed to uh, potentially meet that long-term goal. I think the problem in terms of whether it will grow is will it grow enough and will it grow in the right direction? And could it actually do unforeseen harm? Um, why do I say that? Or why do I think there might be a worry? So this, I guess, for lots of people won't be a big surprise. But my major concern is around uh, the impact of MOOCs. I think they are well-intended. They're run by well-intended groups. And I think they probably have similar goals, or at least some of the goals overlap with the OER movement. But although they may be well intended, and maybe this is not news to you, and it's certainly not news to me, um, they're usually not OERs. And the most important thing that most people value about their outputs is that the thing that's most valued, the certificate or the marker of completion or confidence, is rarely free. Um, they're hardly able to claim they are democratic or inclusive. They tend to be clubs you have to pay to join or be rich enough to own um, or in a position to be able to own 
and it's not clear that they aren't in danger of, to some extent, centralizing learning. Um, there is some evidence, and I obviously can use evidence from our own platform, FutureLearn, but I think it's probably true of some of the other platforms in terms of serving that goal of, edu of serving the educationally unserved, it's not clear to me that they are serving the educationally underserved. And there's certainly a danger that they're serving particularly the bandwidth well served. And so without intending it, they may be unintentionally smothering both the techniques of the OER movement as well as its overall goals. So um, I sat and thought about this for a bit and I looked at some of the outcomes of, um, I think it was the Ljubljana Agreement and the Cape Town uh, 10 Years On Agreement and thought, what are the really big things? And certainly at the OU, some of the things that we think we ought to be doing. So one of the issues is around support. What can we do to facilitate or support people that are working with OERs? And a critical one is if I search now on Google for a free course on maths, the chances are that nine out of 10 of them will come from a commercial MOOC provider who are not running OER in an OER model. So a critical challenge to the OER movement is a massive improvement of understanding of metadata, search engine optimization, and understanding of what search engine optimization means means speaking out of the silo. I'm not necessarily doing a good job here of doing what I'm preaching, which is we often talk to ourselves about this, but we don't talk in the mainstream about the OER movement. And in particular, maybe one of the things we haven't done yet well enough is to make sure that we are engaging the content with major public platforms like Wikipedia or Facebook. Certainly our small experiments we've done at the OU with Facebook have proved to massively increase the awareness of what we're doing on a scale that we just did not predict. Um, where OER might need to do more in terms of support, in terms of those that are participating, um, we've got to find, we have some platforms that can deliver the ability to allow people to make OER content, but sometimes you go to these platforms and they're broken, including our own. Sometimes, sometimes they're not easy to use, and certainly there isn't a one-stop shop to go to that allows you to make OERs quickly and easily that I'm aware of, and perhaps the, the OER world needs a better form of uh, production support. And in terms of where those groups do have OER production tools, they're not necessarily available or made aware to those that are most underserved or most underrepresented. It's not a fault of those platforms, it's just we perhaps need to do a better job at promoting these platforms and others or building new ones. Where else might OER need to do more? I think it's around the motivation factor. And for the user, what we do know about MOOCs is it's the certificates and the badges which people most love. And we know that when we've introduced credentialing and badging onto our platforms, it's produced the most significant uptake of use when people can walk away with a certificate in the case of Open Learn, they walk away with a certificate for free. OERU and Sailor are doing amazing work in the credentialed world around certification and micro-credentialing. But there's much less of that work going on in away from the HE world, in the TVET world. I've, I've yet to see, but maybe I'm unaware of the work that's being done around micro-credentialing and badging um, technical and vocational education. It would be great to see a lot more of that. Um, Again, the other issue is to do with quality markers. I think we need, you know, Open Up Ed is a good start on making quality markers around free and open education materials, but we may need to be more imaginative about thinking about perhaps crowd-based quality markers where the crowd can recommend and bless and promote excellence in the domain. Where else might OER need to do more? Well, I think in terms of the provider, I think a lot of providers are uh, still, in some senses, often confused to themselves why they're bothering to provide OERs beyond wishing to do a, a social good and a piece of altruism. Um, I think one of the issues that we've got to get much better at is promoting the business models and the benefits beyond altruism and ideological commitment. They need to be, we need better articulated business models of being open. And we need to get more projects weaned off project funding and looking at more sustainable business models. Um, 
and it would be great if we were blessed with platforms that could also deliver um, better analytics around OERs. Um, finally, I suggested that we might be doing harm with OERs, and you'd think by releasing open educational content into the public frame that you couldn't do any harm, but actually uh, there is a slight danger, and I think it's a, it is a perennial danger that we have to maturely work through. And this is the tension between techno-romantics and technophobes. So uh, we don't want to be technophobes, and there is a slight danger with the MOOC movement that ex-MOOCs have generated a view of e-learning, which is relatively flat and passive and broadcast and non-participatory and non-actively engaging and reflecting and feeding back. There is a slight danger, I think, with the massive progress that's been made with open textbooks that the whole OER movement becomes rather dominated by a rather flat, non-participatory, non-engaging, non-digital experience beyond the delivery mechanism itself. But at the other end, um, we have the dangers of everybody's techno-romantic, and we exclude those by making OERs, which are only usable in a meaningful way in a bandwidth-rich environment. And so treading that boundary is going to be quite difficult, but there are some real dangers that OERs could do by either excluding by being too um, bandwidth intense or being too conservative by flattening the learning experience because the easy thing to do is to release ebooks. Um, that's me done. I hope I did it in 10 minutes, and I'm really sorry to have been so late. I'm not certain if there's anybody. Three panelists, Estela, and Susan, and I think reason. now Lisa had to leave. So I'm asking Estela, Susan, and myself if we have a comment on what some comments on what uh, on what Andrew uh, presented in terms of uh, the I would say the, the delicate equilibrium between uh, something which can be extremely powerful for the good of learners and mankind, but also extremely I don't want to say harmful, but uh, in the in the best chances useless for for uh, and, and costly, let's say, for most of us. What do you think, Susan and Estela? Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, I, I would say that I, I do feel like Andrew some days when I get up and, you know, just think that, you know, things are failing and this is getting more difficult and more challenging. But then, you know, I get the results from the Year of Open and, you know, events such as this where, it is really not failing. It is still um, a very new movement, even though it's been around 10, 15 years, 20 years. Uh, it's still fairly new because I think so many of us are still working out processes and how we do things and, and how we collaborate and how we grow. So um, I, 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 I will agree with, with Andrew. So I have to admit I was in a particularly bad bad. <laughs> yeah, I have to admit I was Estela, do you want to comment? in a despondent mood on the day I was asked to think about doing a presentation, or, and and I have, or I can, I think, I, go ahead. taken a, a stance which is attempting to be uh, perhaps not very delicately or diplomatically, or indeed fairly to the amazing work and energy that people put into OERs, but the. Uh, I think the reason for being uh, in the UK, we'd call it Eeyore-like, this rather critical view is, is in some senses to, to, to draw a line in the sand about where we really need to focus to make um, OERs 
uh, as effective as they can be given what I perceive as a unintentional but real threat from the MOOC world. Thank you. Uh, I maybe, yeah, let me, yeah, just a couple of sentences. I can share from our Lithuanian perspective here that uh, when we really talk about OER, I think at least in our country, um, it is still very much a process that needs to be uh, understood. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, yeah, I agree our, that, uh, I mean, the, I think it's important, uh, well, this we, uh, is the, really probably the main conclusion out of the study the, we run for, for the JRC uh, European uh, Commission case, uh, on open education policies across uh, uh, all European member states open, and the, the, uh, the lack we have in Europe is that countries like Lithuania or Italy or Spain can that, learn okay, from countries like the UK or others, even France, I would say, where you are more advanced in terms of experimentation let's say, of, uh, of OER, uh, OER possibilities. So I agree that uh, in some contexts, uh, uh, let's say, awareness raising is still very, very important. Uh, and uh, and uh, but let's say we have the luxury of being able to have the possibility of to, to, to learn from others within the, within our European context. In, between, in the meantime, uh, in the chat, a discussion, interesting discussion is going on on uh, open business models. And in fact, we, we almost provided a new title for the next year of open on opening business models. And I would say opening up institutions also, because at the end of the day, what I see many times is uh, open educators within closed institutions. And this, and this is very sad because typically the educators uh, either change institution or get, uh, let's say, get more closed than they motivated. So I think the institutional level is, is very important, let's say. And um, I have an interesting comment or question to Andrew by Irina. Uh, I'm reading it for you, Andrew. Uh, would you agree that there is already a tangible longer term impact of OER development and use for academic community development? And uh, in the OU case, for example, how could you describe this, uh, this long term impact of OER development? In fact, uh, in fact, what I what I see, and uh, and uh, I, I also would like, like Frank, who is living now, would like to participate in some open business models for university, let's say, discussion. Which I think uh, this is, I don't know if this has taken place already outside countries like the UK, but for example, from my university in Spain, we have an open education policy at the moment, uh, freshly announced, freshly freshly launched. And it's probably the first, uh, uh, the first in the country. So, in, uh, and of course, we've been inspired by Edinburgh, by the OU UK. But I think such a discussion would really help uh, the, in general, not only Europe, but at least for sure in Europe, would help the, let's say, raising a bit the bar of the of the objectives of of open education in within the institutions. Thank you very much. Um, we have three well, minutes left. Uh, so the uh, university has been providing OERs in the classic sense, openly licensed. We use a, a, a non-commercial share-alike license, so it's not a pure license, but it's pretty good license. For 10 years, this is our 10th year of operation. Now, uh, one thing we have is a, is a business model of doing that. It works for us. It generates several forms of business benefits to us. We do it for social mission reasons but we extract business revenue out of it. Literally, money, registrations, brand, and some other forms of assets. And very happy to come back on another occasion if people wanted to know more. Although we do publish our policy openly under, I hope, Creative Commons license, so people can look at what the business dynamics of what we do are. Um, so um, we have a, at worst case, cost neutral um, provision of OERs from the Open University. We have about 6 million people a year visiting our OERs on our platform and another on OpenLearn and another 4 or 5 million on other platforms as well. So from an OER point of view, we have an internal consistent business model and we very happily and do, I think, share it, but it's not going to be the same for everyone. Um, it's also causing very interesting disruptions about changing the way we think about helping people come into the institution through acquired prior learning, 
on OERs. So we're experimenting fairly positively with using OERs as part of a credit transfer route into, not credit transfer, as part of an uh, acquired, a required prior learning experience beforehand. So there are definitely tangible business impacts on the open university. There are definitely positive disruptions to the way that we're thinking about producing content. There are definitely really large opportunities to think about. We currently only release 5% of our content under OER license and the rest is kept locked behind doors. There are major opportunities for us to think about using that other content in other ways. So, um, so in terms of business models at the OU, it's not perfect, but it's strong. And we very happily talk about that reasonably openly, um, if not all of the details over the money, but certainly the dynamics of what makes up the business model. In terms of, I think there was a very specific, Ariana was asking about um, the use for supporting academic community development. Um, so we've produced some open courses on how to write open courses. We've produced some open courses on how to search engine optimize your content because we think that's really important. Those things are available and I could share afterwards if people want to know about them. Um, and we, we have, I think, not been as good as an institution um, at encouraging our own academics to use OERs. So there is a slight danger, and never quote me on this, that the OU um, is telling the world to use OERs, but then doesn't use it themselves for their own teaching. And I would love to see the Open University UK do more of that. And I know people like Martin Weller are pushing to do much more of that in the future. Thank you, Estela. Thank you very much. And so I think we have now uh, Andrew, please, if you want to say a last word. Yeah, thank you very much. A very, very good hint, in fact, and I also Absolutely. like very much. Absolutely. First, I would just like to thank everyone, thank Eden for this opportunity uh, to talk about the Year of Open and what it has meant to us during 2017, but also to look forward to the future. And I think a lot of the conversations we've had today, I've been making notes uh, during the presentations of people to contact for 2018, I think we are set up to have some great conversations next year on uh, actionable items such as open business models, open institutions, so that we can uh, be more sharing so that we can share with those that are just developing their OER. So right, thank you very much for the opportunity. The other, very, very I look clever. forward to So I would like to say a year. final word on behalf of myself and of uh, Diana Andone, who I also from the Eden Executive Board uh, had to jump on a plane, cannot be with us for this, could, couldn't be with us for the longer part of the seminar. So I think the seminar was, was quite interesting. We, we were able to, to look at open education from different perspectives, which was a bit the, the challenge at the very beginning from the perspective of the, of the 
let's say international cooperation, virtual mobility, we heard a bit so about, uh, about augmented reality so and about how technological solutions can, can, can move things forward in terms of open education. And then we, we heard about an update really, from uh, really the OEC and from it and about um, many things which happened uh, this year. Uh, and we closed, uh, I would say, with a not, not too negative view by end. I think it was, it's a falsely negative view. At the end of the day, I think if you look really within your slides, you can find some, uh, some seriously positive uh, signs for, for the future. So I would like to thank you on, beha on behalf of Eden uh, for this, uh, for your participation into this event, which again has been recorded and will be uh, made available uh, on the Eden website uh, as soon as possible. Uh, tomorrow, as uh, you can see from the chat, we're going to have a webinar uh, in, entitled Designing Learning Spaces in ODL at the same time. Uh, in the same room, and you can see there the link. So for the ones of you who can be with us also tomorrow, uh, thank you very much in advance, and happy European Distance Learning Week to everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you.